Now when a stream is flowing, it has different energies than a stagnant fluid. A non-flowing fluid has obviously internal energy. That internal energy obviously consists of thermal and chemical. Primarily, we're interested in the thermal piece, which is the motion of the molecules on the molecular scale. And so, what you would normally call heat in your everyday language is what we call thermal energy. It's the motion of the molecules on the molecular scale that's represented by U in this term. Further, the kinetic energy would be considered V squared over 2. Now, you might look at that and say, wait a second, what do you mean? I thought you said it was a stagnant fluid. How come it has kinetic energy? Well, let me give you a for instance. I had to, I've got a pond, and when I bought the house, there were bluegill and bass, and you'd think it would be perfect and I'd be happy out there fishing all the time. I actually have no interest in fishing, but I do have an interest in eating fish, and so my crazy engineer brain, what I really want to do is build a, uh, a hunting submarine where I can go detect the big fish, spear them, and bring them to the surface. I think that would be much more fun. Or maybe capture them, kill them humanely, and, and have dinner, you know, have fish. Toward that end, I'm not particularly interested in eating bluegill and bass. In my pond, they're all relatively small. I mean, I've found about, a, I think, a two-pound bass is the biggest one I've caught. My neighbor loves to fish. He says he's got about a five-pound bass. I don't know if he's making it up or not. Maybe it's a fish story that, you know, how they grow. Who knows? But the bluegill are even smaller. And I've, I have fished and pulled some out and, you know, killed them quickly and filleted them and so forth and then cooked them. And it's a lot of work for a small amount of meat. Plus, I'm not really crazy about the flavor of either fish. So I had my, my pond stocked. I called up a company that stocks ponds and it turns out they could put a uh, yellow perch in them. So I had them put yellow perch in my pond and I think most of the perch became food for the bass but a few of them did survive. I know my neighbor said he caught a yellow perch that was getting bigger and so I'm encouraged. I'll probably have it stocked again. I told you that story because I wanted you to think about the truck that carries the fish to my pond because they had to do it. I couldn't do it. Okay, If you're putting in a, a species of fish that's not native to the area, you don't want it getting out because it could then go to other uh, you know, streams and things and take over. You have an ecological disaster basically where the, the native fish might be wiped out by this invasive species. So they don't, you know, that's, that's somewhat controlled. They don't want uh, other species that shouldn't be in the area to be introduced. So you have to pay and have someone come out that's licensed and they make sure your pond's not going to have runoff where these fish could, you know, get out somehow and get into, say, the Ohio River. But if you think about it, those fish have to be in water, right? So when the truck brings them, well, that water's stagnant. It's not a flowing liquid, but it still has kinetic energy because of its bulk motion. That's the kind of kinetic energy we're talking about here. When that truck's going down the road at 50 miles an hour carrying, you know, a tank of fish, that fluid that those fish are in has kinetic energy. Also, because that that tank is up above the ground level, it also has potential energy. And so you can see how fluid that is not flowing can have thermal energy, kinetic energy, and potential energy. A flowing fluid is fundamentally different. A flowing fluid that's flowing through a pressurized system has flow energy in addition to all the others. And you might be a little bit confused and say, well, how does the kinetic energy work since you've already got a flowing fluid? Well, the key thing is that the kinetic energy Yes, if, if I, you think about pipes in your house, for example, and water hammer. When water is flowing through the pipes, it has a lot of momentum, right? It has kinetic energy. And if you shut a valve quickly, that water is pretty much incompressible, so it's kind of like a train coming to a dead stop, right? It's this long column of water that has momentum that all of a sudden just stops, and that causes water hammer. That's in the kinetic energy term. But because the flow is going through a pressurized system, that's the flow energy piece, okay? So think about the flow energy as if it's compressing. So you shut the valve, that water is going to compress you know, items inside of the pipe. Maybe even the pipe itself, it might open up the pipe a little bit. If water hammer is big enough, it can bust pipes open. Water hammer is not a big problem in my house. When I bought it, it had copper piping throughout, and it was a rat's nest. It was horrible. I took the copper out and, of course, had to you know plan my... My, my approach to things, but I took the copper and I recycled it all, sold the copper for scrap, 
bought PEX and all the fittings and the tools for the price of the copper and put PEX throughout my house. PEX is a polyethylene cross-link pipe and what it does is more flexible. It has a couple advantage over copper. Number one, you don't have to solder it, which I was never very good at soldering copper pipe anyway. Number two, it doesn't take very long to make a connection. You put a fitting in, you put a copper ring around the outside of the pipe and you crimp it in place, you're done. It takes, you know, maybe a couple of minutes to get a joint, whereas soldering takes quite a bit of time. I don't know of anybody that can solder a joint in about a minute or so. So in my piping, the, the PEX has two different advantages. Number one, when that column of water is going along, basically the column of water gets stopped by a valve, but it needs somewhere to go. It needs somewhere for that pressure to sort of dissipate, and the pipe can literally expand a little bit. Also, another interesting thing about PEX, if I ever have a, a big problem where the pipes in the house freeze, polyethylene cross-linked can apparently expand to about five times its normal size without busting. Now you need to replace the pipe once that happens. That's a lot better than having a whole lot of water you know, in your basement from a leaky pipe. So hopefully you see the difference between these two. The flowing fluid uh, specific energy consists of flow energy, thermal energy, kinetic, and potential. Notice I didn't say internal, even though internal is what's shown on this slide. That's because internal energy technically is thermal energy plus chemical energy. Most of the time we're just dealing with the thermal piece. We're not talking about a chemical reaction that gives off energy uh, or changes the chemical energy. So we'll use the symbol theta for the specific energy of a flowing stream and E for the specific energy of a non-flowing stream. And of course it's worth noting that that PV plus U term can be replaced by enthalpy H because that's what enthalpy was made for, was for this flowing fluid. So we could write theta instead of PV plus U with the other terms, we could write it as the enthalpy plus the kinetic energy plus potential energy, which I've then broken out just like it is in the, the chalkboard diagram. So now we can quantify the energy transport rate by mass. If you have mass flowing into a control volume, it is carrying energy with it. It's carrying four kinds. It's carrying potential energy. It's carrying kinetic energy because it's flowing. It's carrying uh, you know, uh, thermal energy. And it's carrying flow energy because it's going into a pressurized container. And of course, we usually combine the thermal and the flow energy into enthalpy, but putting them all together, we just call it theta. If you struggle to understand what I mean by mass carrying uh, energy in per time, the, the power flow rate, and you see this m dot times theta, think about it this way. You've probably seen a Western where the, you know, either a gunfight's going to happen, right? There's going to be a duel which, by the way, that's not the way things really went back in the old days, but who cares, it's entertaining. Maybe there will be a, a, a wagon ride that's attacked by who knows what. Uh, maybe there's a fire that happens, so there's a bucket brigade. There's all these different common uh, things that happen in Westerns. Let's focus on the, the fire brigade. There's a movie that I like. It's uh, got Don Knotts and Tim Conway, and it's a, a child's movie. It's a Disney movie. I grew up on it, and I've shown it to my daughter. I enjoy watching it, I admit now and she's my excuse for watching it again. But one of the things that happens is that these two guys are, are bumbling it, it's idiots, it's a, a comedy, and they end up setting a place on fire. And so then the, the people, it turned out it was soldiers in a fort, set up a bucket brigade where they're going and getting water from the well and you know sending the bucket down the line to throw the, the uh, water on the fire. Think about it like this. Think about the mass that's flowing in as a kilogram. It's like a bucket. Okay, That bucket carries with it a certain amount of energy. Now to get water on the fire, number one, we didn't know how much water is in each bucket. That's what theta is. Theta is like a, it's a kilogram of mass that carries energy, just like the bucket carries water. Whereas the mass flow rate, well that's the rate at which buckets are passed down the line. So m dot, that's the rate at which buckets get thrown onto the fire, see, or the, their contents get thrown onto the fire. So that's what this means, this m dot times theta. So if we want to write the energy flow rate by mass, being carried by mass, the, the mass power, if you will, it would be m dot theta, and we could expand that theta into h plus the kinetic energy v squared over 2 plus the specific uh, potential energy gc. So if you understand all the analogies, great, but here's what you really need in order to quantify power flow rate into or even out of a system as carried by mass. 
a lot of times the kinetic energy and the potential energy will be so small by comparison to the enthalpy that we'll simply neglect them and say that the energy transport rate by mass is just m dot h considering only the thermal and flow energies that the, the fluid carries into or out of the control volume.